So the hypothesis project, not just another ed tech company. Now, what this means when I say this is that we're not, first of all, not just another tech company. We're not VC funded, uh, we're a nonprofit. And this allows us to orient to users, but also to the general culture of the web in a really different way from most tools you probably uh, are being exposed to in the education setting, but really uh, across the web uh, as well. We don't advertise, we don't leverage uh, user data in any, or, or content in any way except to run uh, the service itself. We're also not uh, specifically an education company. A hypothesis is a broad tool that's used across the web by everyday people, um, but also we have focused verticals in scholar communication uh, and publishing. Um, this is our mission. <clears throat> to build, deploy, and nurture an open interoperable annotation layer over the web, enabling a conversation over all knowledge, uh, and to do so uh, as a nonprofit with a sustainable income model. So again, we're a nonprofit. Uh, it's very different from a lot of the companies that you probably are exposed to in education technology. Um, Peg can drop in the link to the deck uh, in the chat for folks who are asking about it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's our belief that annotation technology is sort of a, a, could be a fundamental piece of infrastructure uh, for the web. And as such, we believe that uh, we were formed as a nonprofit to help uh, you know, support and sustain uh, that infrastructure um, outside of a proprietary uh, system. So the people's content's not locked in a certain place, it's not dependent on a for profit model. These are some of our foundation funders. Uh, mostly in the scholar communication space and education and journalism spaces. Um, and as I said, our nonprofit position allows us to orient quite differently uh, to users. And you can see that if you look at our terms of service. Um, for one, all public annotations created using Hypothesis are uh, Creative Commons uh, in, the, in the public domain. Um, like Wikipedia, we believe that this is a, a fundamental piece of infrastructure for a larger knowledge project uh, on the web and it shouldn't be owned uh, or controlled in any kind of editorial sense by one uh, particular uh, power. Um, your own annotations uh, in private, uh, private annotations or in groups are your own. So you, you maintain the right to your, uh, the intellectual property rights to your uh, content. This is quite different from a lot of other terms of service that you find on the web for even the everyday tools that uh, you use. And this is a little inside baseball, but uh, we're also, we also have been advocating for years for uh, open standards um, in web annotation. We've been working closely with the standards body for the web, the W3C, over the past three years uh, to put together these standards. Um, and they were just formally uh, recommended by the W3C in February. And so this means that there are specific protocols for building web annotation tools that people building those tools uh, can follow so that those tools will ultimately be interoperable, that uh, another web annotation service could read hypothesis annotations, you could build your own annotation tool and read hypothesis annotations, um, and that generally the annotation ecosystem will look a lot like the web ecosystem where you can use any browser you want to navigate and read uh, websites. That's all because of uh, standards. We have a specific initiative in scholarly communication, which I think is, is relevant here. Um, the idea that within the next three years, most scholarly works, books, articles, and other digital media, new and old, will come with the capability for readers to create, share, and discover annotations from colleagues, uh, classmates, authors, friends, and experts around the globe. So all of this digital textual content uh, will be annotatable. That's our vision. Um, and it will be based on open standards, just like the web. And we've already gathered a coalition of many university libraries, publishing platforms uh, to participate in this. Uh, for those of you that are scholars, you can probably appreciate the ability to take notes and have conversations across all this different content housed in different places. Um, but even in education, you can imagine students going to a library accessing various databases and being able to use a tool to take notes across those databases or have conversations and discover conversations um, and collaborations uh, through open and interoperable annotation tools across those systems. So that's the hypothesis project. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about annotation itself as a, as a scholarly and uh, scholastic practice. It's really one of the oldest uh, education technologies we have. Um, um, when I was a classroom teacher, I would share um, this poem by Billy Collins. This is a, a, a selection from the poem by Billy Collins uh, every, every year, every semester. 
um, as an invocation for students to, to really take responsibility to grab um, their, uh, to, to, to be active readers and to sort of take ownership over their books and over the, the knowledge that they were studying. So I'll quote really quickly from Billy. We have all seized the white perimeter as our own and reached for a pen if only to show we do not just laze in an armchair turning pages, we pressed the thought into the wayside, planted an impression along the verge. So active reading is something I think he's sort of alluding to here. And I think those of us that are teachers and uh, instructional designers uh, can appreciate. Um, people have been doing this for years, well before uh, digital technologies, annotating in books. Uh, this is a medieval uh, text in Latin. And those of us that uh, I'm sure we all have had experiences uh, in schools when we were students being asked to annotate or as teachers telling our students to annotate, and this is time for my second poll. Maybe I'm getting too fancy with the technology here, but um, to see if I'm right about this, that uh, annotation was a part of our um, education. I know it was a big part of my own education. I can still see in my head those books I had in middle school when I first started writing in books and circling unfamiliar words and defining them in the margins all the way up through, uh, through grad school. Um, but that may not be a completely common experience for all, so I wanted to sort of take uh, a little poll here of how many people, and it looks about evenly distributed. Some people um, were not encouraged to write in books uh, as students, um, and many of us still do annotate readings. That's, that's great. Um, and many of us have problems uh, annotating online. Indeed, if you look at an online text like this version of the Odyssey, we lose the physical ability to, you know, dog your pages, whatever we do to mark our, mark our places in our thinking uh, in text, we lose that ability uh, often with, with the, the text that we're um, presented with uh, online. There's no way to take notes here. So we've lost a sort of fundamental literacy practice when we move online, which adds to the urgency for tools like hypothesis and web annotation more generally to be more broadly uh, adopted. Um, let me see if I'll end this poll and uh, share. You guys are doing a great job. 81 out of 109 people um, uh, responded to that poll, so that's pretty cool. Um, the other problem that we have in reading online is, of course, and this is what I imagine to be many student browsers when they're being asked to annotate, uh, when they're being asked to read something online, is that you can see the text there as one window of many tabs, um, some of which might be relevant to the reading, like a Wikipedia article um, or, or videos that might help explain things that are, that are uh, difficult about the reading. Um, but some of them may be more distracting, like, like Facebook or, or, or even Twitter, unless Twitter's being leveraged by the uh, instructor. In any case, there's a lot of distractions, some of those or a lot of other ways that we might focus our attention rather than on the text itself. Um, and I actually think that web annotation, and especially hypothesis, powerfully leverages some of the really wonderful things about the web as a knowledge source. You know, being able to look up things in Wikipedia, being able to find videos that help uh, bring to life uh, reading. Um, while at the same time re restoring this traditional literacy practice of just simple close reading, grabbing a selection of text, making a comment. Um, and of course, the most powerful aspect of it is that it can be social. Uh, other people can see my annotations, I can share my annotations, and we can work together to get at the meaning of text. We can uh, have threaded conversations about a single selection uh, of text, and I can learn from others and see their comments. Um, so this is a nice image from the New York Times uh, that I think beautifully represents both the sort of analog reading is not going away. You can still have your cat and your armchair and your tea, um, but you're sort of plugged in in an interesting way to others um, in, in a powerful way to, to learn from them and uh, you know, co-create knowledge together. Uh, this is a great quote from Jennifer Howard in the, in the Chronicle of Higher Education. I think also captures nicely this idea of what she calls social reading online. A book can be a gathering place, a shared space where readers record their reactions and conversations. Those interactions ultimately become part of the book too, a kind of amplified marginalia. Um, so the Hypothesis app itself is primarily a browser extension. And you don't need to, to sign up and get the browser extension because we're going to be focusing on the Canvas integration. But most folks that are using Hypothesis are using an add-on to their browser. Um, I do encourage you to sign up for our Hypothesis account. There is going to be a practicum later. Uh, it's free and all you need is a username, which can be anonymous, uh, and an email address, and you will need to confirm. But we will be playing later if you want to participate in the, in the practicum. I would recommend going and signing up now. 
Um, again, this is a live link from uh, the webinar. If you have it, maybe Peg can drop in the, uh, she's dropped in the sign up, but also every once in a while maybe drop in the webinar link itself so people can open this if they want. Um, and you don't have to do this, but most people, as I said, are using a browser extension that you can download from our, the front page of our website. So this allows you to annotate across the web um, outside of Canvas. Um, let me show you really quickly what that looks like and quickly uh, stop sharing and then uh, reshare. There's a more elegant way to do this, but I didn't figure it out. Um, reshare what it looks like to be annotating using the tool and give you a little orientation of what it looks like. So John, can you confirm that I'm now sharing my New Yorker screen? You are. Okay, cool. Um, subscribe to New Yorker. No, just kidding. Um, so this is a great article I actually recommend on this idea of uh, what is happening to us as we move online uh, and reading and, and what we lose by uh, moving away from this sort of physical tactile book uh, towards something slightly more ethereal in, in the web. Really wonderful article. Um, let me go ahead and uh, hide my bookmarks toolbar and you'll just see the New Yorker here. On the upper right hand corner here is my hypothesis extension. Um, and it's, it's, it's dark and, or it's light and right now because it's not active, but it is telling me that there's 85 annotations on this page. And so all I have to do to see those annotations is click and this uh, little sidebar pops out, which I can expand. Um, and I'll start to see these highlights on the, on the text and I can click on, on the highlights and read annotations. Um, I can also scroll through the annotations uh, themselves. You can see some of the annotations have images. Uh, and links. Um, I share this article quite often when I'm talking about hypothesis, so a lot of folks have, uh, have annotated it. It's a highly annotated article. Um, I can scroll through here and click on an annotation to jump to that piece in the text. Um, people are uh, having conversations. So here's an example of an annotation that's turned into a thread of conversation. Um, and of course, I can also uh, create annotations. Uh, and respond. So what was I going to, yeah, so this one I was going to respond to. There's a little reply button um, and I can say not fully coherent, but uh, now I've replied to that comment. That person will now get a notification that somebody replied uh, to their uh, comment. Um, and I can also create an original annotation by just simply selecting text. You use medium, it looks a lot like sort of making any page on the web, uh, on the web look like medium where a little bubble pops up, little options to annotate. Highlights are private by default. And so here I'm going to annotate. Um, and right now it's set to only me. Um, so I'll change that to public. I want to make this a public comment, but I could make an only me or, or private annotation. Um, and just say I never got and James, I know my grad school friends will um, be ashamed that, that, that I admitted this, but I really just never, never got into him. Everybody says he's so wonderful. Um, I'm sure he is, but I never, I never figured it out. Um, I can also annotate as part of a private group. So if I was annotating this article uh, as part of, say, a course I was teaching, um, and I guess that's right now, um, I'd have a sort of a completely different layer on the text as part of this group. Um, and you can see if there's any annotations as part of the Canvas webinar, uh, it wasn't assigned, so there's not. Um, but there is one uh, in my uh, spring 2017 group, um, and there's a bunch uh, in public. So a few other things just to orient you. You can see the numbers of annotations down here, that there's still 36 annotations as I scroll down. Um, this turns off the highlights, if you prefer to look at it without the highlights. Um, these are page notes. So these are annotations created uh, on the page. You can see my colleague Johnny Dell looks like he's created some machine annotations on this page. Um, but these are page level notes um, about the document. So it's a great way to sort of add a head note if you're doing something with the class, say, I want you guys to look for this. Um, but also sometimes we do want to make a comment uh, about the, the, the text as a whole. So that's what you can do here. Uh, Peg, look like you raise your hand. If there's something that you want to say, you can feel free to unmute yourself. Um, and then up here we have a search. I can search the annotations on the page. I can also reorder them by newest or oldest. Um, I can share a direct link to this page. The really neat thing about this is that if I was to email this to you, even if you didn't know what hypothesis was, 
this via dot hypothesis link. Uh, it would open up this New Yorker page with uh, all the annotations displayed. And I can even do that from a specific annotation. So if I want to share this specific annotation, this will open up this uh, website, activate hypothesis, and then scroll to this annotation, which is really a, a revolutionary thing in terms of the web. Heretofore, we've basically always, the URL has been the main uh, way to point to people to information on the web. But because now I can point to a specific selected piece of text and a specific comment on it, we really have a much more granular way of, um, of engaging with content online. Um, so that's these share links are pretty cool. And then I have some account options. I won't go too far into this except to show that uh, all users have profile pages. And so this is my profile page. Uh, because I'm logged in right now, you'll see annotations that are both private and part of uh, some of my private groups that I'm a member of. Um, I believe that I am the uh, all time uh, highest annotator. Uh, John can correct me on that. That's not a robot at least. There's an asterisk for not being a robot. Um, but you can see I use the tool a lot, obviously. Here are some of my tags. And this is basically a search uh, across annotations that I have access to. So I can, this is a search for basically all public. If I take away the Jeremy Dean user, that's all public annotations. You can see what people have been annotating more recently. I can filter by another username, uh, say my colleague Jay Udell, since I'm picking on him. So these are John Udell's annotations. Um, and I can also filter by all his sort of info world. So this is all his annotations tagged info world. So it's a search. You can slice and dice content online. And you can also look at annotations uh, for the group, which I'm going to hold off on uh, just for a second. Um, and uh, I think I'll pause there and uh, try to bring up the chat again, because uh, I lost it and see if uh, there are some questions that people have at this point. Um, about the client. So that's, that's what it looks like to activate Hypothesis. It doesn't look any different inside of Canvas. I'll talk about specifically how it works inside of Canvas, but that's the basic um, way that Hypothesis works, and it works across the web as a browser plugin, as I mentioned. Um, Jeremy, the, uh, yeah. the only question we have so far in chat that hasn't been answered is this. Um, Paul has asked if students can download their annotations into a document. That is an excellent question, and it is uh, coming. It is definitely in the roadmap. I think in the next uh, three or four months, I'd have to check. Um, but the ability to export annotations, we actually have a prototype for this and can share it sort of on a one-to-one -one basis, and we'd love to get your feedback about, you know, the formatting, what formats you want to put it in. Um, so we actually can do that, and you can do it through our API. But to make it part of the client is something we're planning to do in the next few months. Um, precisely because it's just a powerful thing for a student to be able to do, especially when you saw my uh, collective annotations, and, and I use it this way if I'm giving a talk, like I'm giving a talk later this week at Middlebury on language learning. Maybe I'll just go ahead and pull this up and expose myself a little bit. <laughs> um, but uh, so I can go and look at my tag for language learning. And so these are all my annotations that I'm doing as part of my research for uh, a talk I'm giving uh, on annotation and language learning. Um, I only have, you know, uh, uh, 13 annotations so far, but I plan to get to work in the next few days for this talk. Um, but this is a way for me to gather all that research, essentially. And yes, I would love to be able to export that, put it into a file that I can then cut, cut and paste from for a paper or something else. Um, so export of annotations is coming. There'll be a couple different formats. As I said, there's a prototype that we'd love some feedback on, and you actually could use today if you if you, if you wanted to. Um, so that's, uh, that's that. Uh, anything else? That's basically the demo of the client. Yeah, actually, uh, we've got uh, a kind of host of questions that have popped up here, um, both in the chat and in the Q&A area. Okay. Um, and so um, just uh, in the addressing the ones in chat, uh, is there a tutorial for students to learn how to use Hypothesis? There's a whole host of uh, tutorials about how to use Hypothesis. There is a student uh, guide. If Peg could maybe drop in the sort of educator portal link, um, you can navigate in there to a student guide. That's a student-facing guide that talks about the different ways to, uh, different aspects of Hypothesis, like best practices for tags, how to add images to your annotations, uh, basics on how to get set up, um, how to navigate the, the, the profile page. Uh, so yes, there's a host of resources. 
uh, out there for both teachers in terms of getting set up, but also uh, for students to get set up. Uh, let me go back to sharing. We're gonna, go ahead. We're going to address the accessibility question a little bit later on um, for the person who asked that. Uh, there's also there's uh, quite a few questions here, Jeremy. So if you you might want to answer them as quickly as possible. Quite a few. Qu answer them quickly. <laughs> yeah. Can I, are you ready for another one? Yeah, I am. I'll just say that the next slide, slide 25, actually has a link to that student resource guide and to a teacher resource guide and to a, specific, a couple specific tutorials on profile pages, creating groups, navigating the group homepage, which I haven't talked about yet, but we'll get to in a second. Uh, and we also have a YouTube channel that has these, some of these tutorials in video format as well. I'm having trouble seeing the, the questions, Nate, so it'd be great if you right. could pick and choose for me. I am. Um, are there any preferred browsers or are there browser, browser compatibility issues? Yeah, the preferred browser is definitely Chrome for the time being. Uh, we're going to ship a Firefox, uh, Firefox add-on very soon. Um, so that uh, will have some parity with the Chrome uh, 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 extension and then using the Chrome browser. Um, Safari and Internet Explorer, I mean, it, it functions on all browsers, but really uh, Chrome and Firefox are your best bet. I think that those, some of the issues that come up with the other, I will call them lesser browsers, uh, aren't as big a deal within uh, the Canvas uh, setup. It more has to do with adding this, this browser extension. Within the Canvas setup, as you'll see, Hypothesis is sort of native to the Canvas uh, course. So some of the browser issues don't come up as well as some of the mobile issues. Um, it's, you know, we're not totally 100% mobile compa uh, compatible as yet, although it's obviously in the roadmap. Um, but actually, I've heard from our Canvas users that on mobile devices, when in Canvas, things work uh, better than uh, when using the browser extension. Great. Um... So here's a couple of other questions from the uh, question and answer module. Um, can you re restrict access to other annotations? Susan Harlan asked. And um, Susan, we may not be entirely clear on that. Um, Jeremy can address, he kind of went over the different privacy options, but he can, he can kind of point you to that again. But we, right, may, so we may need more clarification on your question. So there's, you can make private annotations, which were, are viewable only to you. Um, and you can also create a private group, invite others to the group, and you know, circumscribe that set of annotations to a certain set of viewers. And we're actually going to do that in just a second. Um, so let's, let's take a quick look at the Canvas integration. Um, I know what you're thinking right now, which is like, wow, that's so awesome. I can annotate any web page online. Why the heck would I want to go and do that within an LMS? Well, um, as, a, as a teacher or as an instructional designer, I'm sure you know um, that you know, LMS is our primary way, uh, if not the primary way, to deliver content for courses, and so the content is living there, and Hypothesis or whatever web annotation tool you're using needs to function uh, within that uh, platform. It's a critical piece for people to understand that Hypothesis is not a place where you host content. You bring the tool to content. So you add it as a web browser, can navigate the web, any website or PDF that's online, you can annotate with the tool. Um, in the case of Canvas, uh, we, we bring the tool there for you so that you can annotate PDFs uh, and web pages within. Discussions forum are, are dead. I think I had a poll about this. I don't know if folks agree, but um, I just don't think discussion forums are really built for discussion. Um, let's see if I have a poll about this. I may have gone too crazy with these polls. Um, but especially once you get out of the sort of general, maybe introduce yourself type of uh, discussion forums, when you're actually talking about text, so much better to be in line uh, with the text and basically create your own organic discussion forums around um, whatever piece of, you know, organic material, <laughs> authentic, you know, uh, learning object, a line from a poem is actually of interest to students or of confusion to students or worthy of discussion rather than sort of artificially recreating that. Um, uh, there's also some added functionality within Canvas actually that you don't get from the web browser tool um, because uh, we can sync with the speed grader in some really interesting ways, which I'll talk about. Um, but I do think, you know, our belief is that uh, this, is a, this is a tool that people can use within the LMS to introduce students to this really powerful functionality. But obviously our mission is all about taking it beyond the LMS, using it out on the open web, having people be critical readers uh, and, you know, uh, critically engaged with content uh, outside of uh, the classroom, outside of the LMS, beyond the university. Um, 
So what can you do with the Hypothesis app uh, in Canvas? So we're now focusing specifically on Canvas functionality. Um, you can configure Hypothesis to appear on readings uh, within the LMS, uh, PDFs that are in the file repository uh, for the course, or external public web pages. So a U URL for an article on the web, uh, you can enter into uh, the app and then present within Canvas with Hypothesis active. And what hypo the Hypothesis app in Canvas does is it negates the need for, uh, for the extension to the browser. So you may have not even understood yourself what a browser extension is. You probably really don't want to explain what that is to uh, 200 students. Uh, you don't have to because Hypothesis will just appear on these documents uh, natively within Canvas if you have the uh, Hypothesis Canvas app. You can either create readings that are annotatable uh, and aren't assignments, or you can create readings that are annotatable and then students would submit their annotation sets from those assignments. So you could have a really great discussion on a, a PDF of say an academic article and then have the students uh, submit their piece of that discussion, all the threads that they started or all the threads that they replied to. Um, and then you can grade it if you want to uh, do that, but you can also offer private feedback through SpeedGrader. And uh, again, the rubric is up to you, however you want them annotating, but this does give you a way to, um, I don't want to say hold them accountable, but to certainly look more closely at the work you've asked them to do. I mean, when I was growing up, of course, uh, as I'm sure the case for many of you, teachers told me to annotate, um, and it was sort of assumed, I did this as a teacher too, like it was assumed like, oh, that would just be good for you to do that, write in your books, right? Now we can actually see what that looks like, help students develop the skill, um, and, and help them become better readers as, as a result. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Here's a New York Times article that was actually assigned as part of the, uh, this course. Um, loading within Canvas, and you can see the sidebar there, the hypothesis sidebar. Um, let me just play real quickly here. Uh, see the hypothesis sidebar, did that work? Oh, annotation feature within Zoom. See, it's everywhere. Um, I'm gonna get out of that. Uh, and uh, this is what the submission process looks like. Oh no, now my annotation is going to stay there. They need to talk to us about how to do a better annotation tool than Zoom. Um, how do I get rid of that? Uh, clear. Clear my drawing. Okay, um, so here you can see, now I'm obsessed with it though. Um, let me do it again. Uh, you can see the submission piece here. I can enter a username after I've annotated the, the document. Um, this manual piece of having to enter a hypothesis username will soon go away. If you're using the app today, which you can, and I encourage you to follow the links later to, to sort of get set up in a test environment or even start using it in a course this spring if you're, if you're that excited. Um, this manual piece of adding a, a hypothesis account name will go away later and I'll explain why. Um, but that's how you submit, how a student would submit an assignment. Um, and then, yeah, the annotation feature within Zoom is not awesome, I don't think. Sorry, Zoom. Otherwise, everything's great. Very happy. Um, and this is what it looks like in SpeedGrader. So these are all model students' annotations on this particular uh, document, which happens to be the poem Marginalia by Billy Collins. Uh, I can see, uh, because it's a screenshot, I can't scroll down, but he has, uh, or she has two original annotations. And then you see this annotation by Alan Reed is showing up because later down, model student responded that annotation. I can assess it. I mean, the assessment is up to you. You can make it pass, fail, whatever. You can give it a, a letter grade. I uh, can give it a number. But I think the really cool thing is that you can, you know, give personal one-to-one -one feedback about the practice of annotation, which I think as somebody working for an annotation tool and a long-time annotator, it's really neat to get that kind of feedback. Um, but this, uh, this assignment piece is not necessary. You can just have hypothesis on readings and make it low stakes, uh, something that, you know, is just Good for good for good medicine for your uh, critical reading soul of your students. Um, so how to do this? There'll be links later, um, but you can ask a Canvas admin at your university to install Canvas in your course. You can also do it yourself by creating an API token, and we have very clear, I think, uh, straightforward instructions on how to do that. You'll communicate some stuff to us, and we'll get you set up. Um, and then Hypothesis will appear, appear as an external tool if you used external tools before. Not yet in the App Store. Hopefully by uh, the end of the summer we'll be in the App Store and this whole installation process will be less manual, but really not that hard to do, um, even if you don't consider yourself tech uh, savvy. Here are the links. There's an install guide. 
uh, that can directly link to the admin um, way to do it or to the instructor way to do it from here. Maybe Peg can once again send out the, uh, the link to this uh, webinar deck just so people have it because again there are these resources. There's a teacher guide on how to use it and then again a student guide about the submission process and, and stuff like that. Um, I just want to quickly mention we do have some other integrations with WordPress and Pressbooks and Scalar. Um, and if you're building your own website, again, this is a Canvas webinar, so the, the Canvas uh, piece is the focus. But if you're building your own website, you can also add Hypothesis to it with some simple JavaScript. All right. Um, now it's time for the practicum. If you're not, I'm going to pause real quickly and see if Nate wants to surface anything for me before we get our hands dirty. So this is a good time if you're all caught up, you feel really excited, it's a good time to get signed up and confirm via email if you do want to play with us. I'll also be jumping out of the slide deck and, uh, and navigating the Canvas uh, course for this webinar. And so you can just follow along and see uh, how everything works there. Uh, but let me pause for a second and see if Nate, if there's anything to surface. Yeah, so Jeremy, um, I just wanted to point out there's a couple of people that have asked about uh, pricing and costs, and I know that Jeremy's gonna address that at the end of the, of the webinar, so we'll get to that. We are not ignoring you. We'll, we'll get to that when the time comes. Um, and then Jeremy, just so you know, there's a couple of open questions in the Q&A that have more to do with um, some of the pedagogical background of, of using annotations. So I thought I'd leave that for the time when your fellow panelists are going to be addressing. Great, right. so. yeah, and I should speed up so we can get to that because uh, okay. we have some practitioners and really that's the heart of it all. That's the part that I certainly could talk about all day, but I think it'd be more powerful for us to hear from some folks that use in the classroom. So I'm going to try to pick up the pace a bit. I know I'm probably already going too fast. I generally include too much in these webinars. Um, but now's a good time if you want to play to sign up for our hypothesis account and visit the Canvas course. Um, maybe Peg can put in those links for us um, and then choose one of the readings. And uh, if you want, if you're enrolled in the Canvas course, you can submit your uh, annotation as homework. And I'll be showing what that looks like and maybe I'll grade you live. <laughs> um, so sign up, visit the Canvas course and, and join enroll. It's in the upper right hand corner. Um, some folks already did this. Uh, you'll want to join the private group for uh, this webinar. Um, and you can do that either by, there's a link to it. Basically groups work by sharing a link that somebody with a hypothesis account, when they visit that link will be automatically registered in that group. Um, so it's privacy by obscurity. Um, but there's also, I added uh, the group homepage to the NAP and to the navigation in, uh, in, in my Canvas course and I have a tutorial on how to do that. And what this allows is not only a quick and easy way for students to sign up for the group, um, but also after you've signed up, this link becomes a kind of homepage for all the activity of the group. And so that, uh, let me go back to my annotation tool. This is probably what's taking, making me go so long, but um, this little added piece in the navigation ends up being a, uh, an activity stream for the group listing all the documents. So I can go text by text and see mine and my classmates' annotations, um, but from the group homepage is where I can then go and see over the past Few weeks if we've been annotating regularly um, what that looks like um, uh, and so there's some in the practicum there's like three different documents that could be annotated the marginalia poem um, and the uh, uh, ten ways of to annotate with students and this uh, article by, by Kelly et al about annotation in a physics classroom so I'm going to jump out of this um, and uh, jump into my Canvas course. To give, it, give a slightly awkward uh, transition. Um, John, can you confirm that I'm now sharing the Canvas course? It looks like I am. Yep. You are. Uh, and so this is my Canvas course for the uh, for this class uh, for this webinar. Uh, it's an uh, so it'll be a, a resource for you moving forward. It has some readings if you're interested in the pedagogy of annotation or or why do it or what's so cool about it. I really love the Sam Anderson piece. Um, this piece by Kelly Hutchison uh, is a really wonderful piece about annotating in the secondary school classroom. And really, it's also it really starts with analog annotation and goes on to sort of digital possibilities with things like Hypothesis on Google Docs. Jason Jones is an amazing piece about uh, annotation in the liberal arts classroom. Um, for those of you that are in the uh, humanities, this Paul Schacht piece is, is also quite 
quite great. And then this Kelly piece is about a physics classroom at Harvard using a different tool. Um, but it's, you know, heavy duty research about the power of annotation. So a worthwhile read. Um, there's a piece by me and about Megan and by uh, an English professor in Florida about using a hypothesis specifically in the classroom. An article by uh, Jesse Stummel, Sean Michael Moore. So these are, these are readings relevant to the, the, the stuff. But, and there's a discussion forum where you can test out this theory that discussion forums are dead. Uh, we can take a quick peek in there and see what people have said. Um, and see, I actually look, you know, just already annoyed by it because I have to scroll through the whole poem first and then get down to here and see some annotations. Um, and I'm, maybe I'm just too much of an annotation nerd, but I don't like this way of interacting. Find this one to be um, much more powerful so we can look at this one and uh, loads in another window to give us a little more real estate. That's an option within the assignment settings. Um, and here we are, you see, um, it automatically opens on the Canvas webinar group because that's where I was annotating most recently, but there is a public page and I created an annotation there letting people know um, that they uh, were in the wrong place. And then a couple of people annotated here, that's fine. It is the biggest mistake that students make to land on a text and if they're being asked to annotate in a private group, not necessarily toggling to do so. So public Canvas webinar, here's what folks have said. Um, you can see uh, C.A. Turner and I already engaged in conversation. Um, some of my dummy accounts, uh, folks responding to Alan's annotations here. Um, and I can also sort of go through the text uh, there and I can submit here. Um, so let's go back to uh, the modules. So that's, uh, that was a web page ported in to um, to uh, Canvas, but this is a PDF. So this is a PDF that was uploaded into the file repository of the course, and then an assignment was created from that uh, file. Um, and you can see that uh, folks have, uh, uh, Ms. Hitchcock has been annotating it and uh, in, in conversation about that. So PDFs and websites within Canvas. Um, and Briefly leave uh, the student view just to show you um, when I'm creating an assignment, this is after already having installed the, uh, the, the app, um, which again we have clear documentation for. So I give it a title and then I come down here um, and I click on external and I find it and I add hypothesis and I'm given a choice between uh, adding a PDF will be a list from my file repository in the course or an external web page. So that's the workflow for creating an assignment. It's the same workflow for just adding hypothesis to uh, a reading as part of uh, a module. Um, let's take a look at uh, SpeedGrader and let's go to an assignment. Um, and I really appreciated it, Ms. Uh, that, uh, let me see, I'll go here. Ms. Hitchcock was it? Um, go to speed grader. A lot of us will not have submitted our assignments, but Christine Hitchcock has. So this is what it will look like uh, in speed grader. Ms. Hitchcock submitted her annotations. Um, and so here, maybe she didn't, um, no, it's waiting. So uh, <clears throat> these are all Ms. Hitchcock's annotations on that particular document, the PDF about the physics classroom at Harvard. Um, and so I'm just seeing her threads that she's involved in. So she has two top level annotations. Um, and I can give her a five out of five and tell her, great work. Thanks for participating. Um, would love feedback about this piece of how it's working in SpeedGrader. Um, I think it's pretty neat that you can sort of take this, uh, this, uh, cross section of a student's activity and look really closely at their practice. And again, I'm not necessarily pushing the grading piece of it, but I like the ability to give Ms. Hitchcock uh, feedback there. So that's what it looks like in SpeedGrader. Um, I think that's all I want to show about hey, uh, the app. Jeremy, yeah. Jeremy, can you make it clear that um, the annotations are still visible on the document itself as well as um, separately in the grader? Yeah, because so- Tammy's, Tammy's asking. She's, con she's uh, concerned that, they, that all the annotations are still linear and separate from the document. No, nope, uh, that's the, the, the document is where it's set. The in-context annotation is what we're all about really at Hypothesis. And so I can see Ms. Hitchcock's annotations right here. 
here they are in the context of the document. Um, I can, as a teacher, reply to them, you know, actively here. Um, if I want to give sort of a non-evaluative feedback or just engage with her in conversation, uh, I can do that right here. Um, so it's all part of the doc. Um, I can also, you know, this is a, a robust archiving of, of, of user content. So I can go to Ms. Hitchcock's hypothesis profile outside of Canvas and see her annotations there. Um, and so these are all of Ms. Hitchcock's annotations. Wow, Ms. Hitchcock, you get an A for the course for sure. Um, for all your work uh, just in the past seven days. Uh, so these are all her individual contributions to, um, you know, outside of the context uh, and hypothesis. I can also view those document by document within SpeedGrader. And I can also view, again, the, the all be saved in context, but I can also view um, the group's activity um, out of context in, uh, at the group homepage. So these are all just different ways to see the same content. Again, they're, they're anchored on the page, they're safe there, um, but these are other ways to sort of get a broader sense of what's going on. If we were using tags across multiple documents, I could get interesting views on the activity. Um, but here are all the people as part of the course. If I wanted to just say not, uh, if I didn't want to use SpeedGrader, somebody's not using Canvas, I can, for example, uh, see just uh, Shirley's uh, annotations as part of the Canvas webinar group here. Um, so there's other ways to view the annotations out of context. But yeah, the in context piece is what Hypothesis is all about. So that does not go away. Uh, thanks for that. And I'll just point out that Jeremy also just addressed uh, the ability to be able to see a, a specific student's annotations and uh, in isolation. So apart from all the other students' work, he was just quickly showing that. Yeah, and I'll just, about let me just show one more thing really quickly um, to start to pick on you, uh, Ms. Hitchcock, but um, let me go to Ms. Hitchcock's uh, contributions here. Um, Tina, you haven't submitted your annotations. Catherine, you guys got to do your homework. Um, where is Ms. Hitchcock? Um, there she is. So here are Ms. Hitchcock's annotations. Um, as part of uh, SpeedGrader, right? Um, but say I want to step back and say, okay, Ms. Hitchcock, I really want to think about her work across the semester. Then I can click here and I'll go outside of Canvas. Uh, oh, this is the wrong link, John. So this would normally go to their, um, to their annotations, I think. But uh, you can here, actually you can export annotations here. Um, I can see all of Ms. Hitchcock's annotations across multiple documents. So if I really want to step back and see her work across the semester, especially if I'm advising her maybe on a final paper or final project and looking at her annotations across multiple documents and how she might translate that into another kind of uh, project, um, I can do that. So um, I'm and going Jeremy, to... Yeah. Jeremy, not to uh, dwell on this, but so a student could also see their own annotations in isolation, right? Yep and eventually export uh, those annotations to generate the raw materials for that, uh, for that um, summative assignment, if that's the direction somebody wants to take the annotation work. I am woefully behind. Um, I want to accelerate to the teacher roundtable and really give our teachers uh, a lot less time than I said, they would, I said I would, so I apologize for that. Um, but now is the time where I'd like to hear from uh, first Chris and then Michelle and then Alan. Uh, I'm sorry to cut you guys short. I, I did not do the timing uh, well for this, um, but I think this is the most important piece, obviously, is hearing how teachers have used it in the classroom, hearing their enthusiasm. It's the best part of my job. Um, so let's go ahead. I'll stop sharing um, and you guys can unmute and um, let's talk about your experiences using Hypothesis in the classroom. Chris, you want to I think, start okay, so I think you wanted to go sequentially. So um, I'll just share real quick. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Chris Long. I'm an ed tech coordinator at Huntington Beach Union High School Districts. And uh, I just wanted to share a couple of examples of how our teachers and students are using Hypothesis. Uh, so I have a quick uh, screen share so you can see what I'm talking about. Let's turn that on real quick. Is that... Is that working? It's not working. Forget the screen share. So, um, so just just a couple of examples uh, in 
in a in a high school class where we have uh, it's a develop, developmental reading course. Uh, so these are real low level level readers. Um, one of the instances where they're using hypothesis is they're using uh, an article of the week. And so one of the articles of the week was uh, an article from the Los Angeles Times that talks about in the land of the free, are you free to sit out on the national anthem? So I was talking about uh, Colin Kaepernick's um, stance that he's taking. And so it was good to see that the, the students are engaged in a current event and then taking a stance on it. But as I was helping the students with the teacher, uh, we realized that a lot of the assumed background knowledge that the article just kind of assumes that uh, a reader would have, these students were totally missing. So one of the ways that um, the teacher and I uh, used the tool was they would highlight people in the article and um, there's a lot of people, there was over 20 people mentioned in the article. Um, a lot of them didn't even know who Colin Kaepernick was, so they found a picture. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was mentioned, so one student found a picture, and then all of a sudden it's like bringing the reading to life. So now they see, oh, there's there's a Lakers player. Uh, they, they may not have grown up watching Kareem, but then now they know he's a basketball player, uh, and they know his color. Uh, and then a lot of students were able to find like Wikipedia articles or websites of, of things that were mentioned in the article. So that was uh, one way that I think it really helped the students to actively engage in the reading and bring the reading to life and bring that background information that they didn't have um, to the table. Uh, another example is uh, in a hybrid economics class. This, is, this would be a senior level class for us um, where one of our teachers, um, he actually kind of flips the assignment where the students are, are, are actually charged to go out and um, kind of scout and find current event articles that relate to the content of the course. Uh, and then they, they do, he has a protocol for them where they're going to uh, annotate it together. The student that finds it does a screencast video uh, of, of their thoughts on it. And then they do a writing assignment afterwards. And um, he was also um, really impressed with how the students were, their, their writing after, uh, annotating and, and the discussion they have during the annotation phase has increased the quality of their writing. And I'll go ahead and stop there and, and, and let the next panelist talk. Thanks, Chris. Michelle, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your work with Hypothesis and maybe specifically the, the grading uh, rubric piece? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Sprouse. I'm currently a doctoral student at the University of Michigan. I'm studying English and education. Uh, but in my former life, I was a middle school teacher and I taught an English language arts course. So I want to share a little bit. Um, oops. Sorry there. I want to share a little bit about how I use the rubrics in Canvas to give my students feedback on their annotations. I think that's one of the really great things about this integration here. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen. Give it a sec. I think uh, we were told that Chris has sort of popped up. There, I can see it. Okay. So I think what we're looking at right now is um, a set of annotations. I'm there. I, I was my test student earlier this morning. Um, and you can see my two annotations. I set up the rubric. And just like I'm grading in any other um, Canvas assignment with a rubric, I can select um, the the um, quality of the work that I see there and um, give my students feedback. Um, we saw earlier Jeremy left some comments. All of that can work together to give our students some formative feedback on how they're doing with their annotations. Um, I also want to share um, a rubric that I used for my middle school students in English language arts tied to the Common Core state standards. All right, can you see this reading literature rubric now? Yep. All right, awesome. So um, this was before Canvas was integrating with uh, Hypothesis, so we don't see Hypothesis annotations next to this, um, but I was able to set up um, some categories there aligned to the Common Core State Standards for Reading Literature. And so I might be able to um, use this if I were teaching middle school students again to give them um, more specific feedback on the different standards in terms of reading and what I see in their annotations. And um, I think for the sake of time, if um, we want to keep going, um, I would just say like the idea of the formative assessment is really important. Um, 
I typically just give my students credit for completing assignment versus um, um, being really picky about grades and things here. Um, and I'm able to use the kinds of things that they're bringing up in their annotations to build on our class discussions for the next day. So I really love that ability to, only, to see um, in hypothesis the broad picture of how students are interacting together. And then in Canvas, I can really narrow down into how individual students are are engaging with the text. That's so cool, Michelle, thanks. And I hadn't seen that rubric yet, but I'm hoping that we can get, uh, maybe you'll share that in the Canvas community somewhere um, and that we'll get more like that. I mean, I could see somebody really translating that common core alignment into a rubric that then was a kind of Canvas piece. And I haven't waited in myself to rubrics, but you can add these rubrics, you can create one and add it uh, to your you know, assignment or in, into SpeedGrader somehow. And, uh, definitely develop a, a tutorial about that uh, talk more to uh, to Michelle about that but uh, down the line I could see lots of different types of rubrics going there representing lots of different ways to think about annotation Alan very briefly I'm sorry to cut everybody so short um, but you want to say any last words it looks like your twins are still sleeping <laughs> luckily yeah um, yeah we're just going to touch on uh, peer review using hypothesis within canvas really quickly so um, in my courses, I teach graduate courses in um, a master's of arts in writing course. So it's heavily um, writing intensive. And so uh, what they do is the students um, each have their own assignment. So they, they choose one text that they would like uh, reviewed from the other students. And we do a sort of writer workshop on that. Um, and this is what it looks like, sort of similar to what Jeremy was showing earlier. Um, when students open the assignment, they, they see, in this case, Kimberly's paper. Um, and what I ask my students to do is, as the author, I ask them to come up with at least five questions that they would like to ask um, their reviewers to address. So um, it's kind of small text here, but she's asking her reviewers five specific things that she would like addressed in her paper. Um, and then all the students in the course uh, sort of go through her text um, doing a close reading and provide all of these close annotations to it. Um, and then on my end, because it is an assignment, um, I am using the speed grader and assigning a grade for the quality and the volume of the um, annotations that the students are providing on the work. So again, doing similar to what Jeremy showed earlier, I'm clicking on the user, uh, in this case, Chris, I'm clicking on his annotations for that document and then assigning it a grade. So um, it's a gradable assignment and uh, the author gets valuable peer review feedback um, and everybody sort of wins. So That is so awesome, Alan. Uh, I'm, I'm really sort of mind blown. I'm so glad you brought in this peer review piece. And I remember teaching freshman comp years ago and feeling like peer review was kind of this throwaway thing. I mean, it was something I thought was important for both the, the, the reviewer uh, and for the reviewed in terms of improving writing, but it was hard to pin it down as something that we talked about, you know, what is good feedback, what is not good feedback, and just seeing that, it's, it's amazing. I, I, can, I can imagine that the papers must be so much better when they get revised. Quick question, um, do students send you their papers and then you upload them to Canvas, or can they do it themselves? I've been experimenting with that. In the beginning, they were sending them to me, and it's a small class of, I think, eight or nine, so I was uploading them individually. But um, in Canvas, you can just open up the files section, I believe, and they can drop them in uh, just real quickly. And, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, if you, if you go to the file section, I have a folder for student writing, and they should be able to upload the documents there. And then when you're creating the hypothesis assignment, you can choose the PDF from that list. Okay. Wow, that's such a cool example. Thanks, Alan. I'm so glad we brought you in last minute. All right, um, we are uh, out of time. I, I can, we can keep going. I'm gonna keep going. I have a few more things to say. Folks can obviously drop off. This will get recorded. Um, but I do wanna just share a few last things. I know there's some questions about uh, pricing and things like that that I'm gonna get to in this just last few minutes. Um, but again, if you need to drop off, please do. And then um, I'm always available. Uh, not always, I have two little children, but. Uh, you can use my email, direct email to get in touch with me um, and I can help you get set up. We can review, you know, we can talk about uh, getting started one-on-one. -on -one. I already see some folks have emailed me uh, keys and secrets to get their uh, app installed. 
Um, so what's coming? There's some big pieces that are coming in the next few months that I think are going to, I'm sure your minds are already blown, but there's some big pieces coming in the next few months that are going to really uh, completely blow it out of the water, I think. Uh, it's just an awesome tool for hypothesis, uh, for, 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 for Canvas and for, and for classrooms. Um, and this stuff, most of it is coming by fall. So we're looking to really push in pilots at some universities in the fall. Um, the first is, uh, the big thing is authentication. As you might have noticed right now, you have to, students would have to individually sign up for hypothesis accounts. They have to join groups uh, you know, manually and they have to uh, manually type in their hypothesis username to submit assignments. Not all that crazy of a thing to do. It's all a pretty easy process. Once you join the group, it's done. Um, you know, entering a username is not too difficult, but definitely understand that you know, for a person lecture course, it might be hard to really track down everybody making sure they signed up and that they um, you know, submitted their assignments with their proper username. Uh, so eventually, and quite soon, we're gonna have uh, authentic uh, authentication through the Canvas LTI, so that students would show up in a course and be provisioned with an account, probably being asked if they already had one, um, and then uh, be provisioned with an account if they don't, given some kind of username from the Canvas, uh, from Canvas uh, you know, data, like, um, and then automatically logged in. So at that point, that means next fall, students showing up to a course, essentially might not know what hypothesis is, because it will just be active on the documents it needs to be active, and they'll be provisioned with an account. So it'll really be a seamless, frictionless part of the Canvas experience of reading uh, a text. Um, the, the group piece, automatically assigned into a group, may come later. So we'd have to wait and see uh, how this thing that we're working on currently will play out. But again, eventually you'd be automatically uh, given an account, automatically logged in, and automatically placed into a group aligned with a course if that's what the professor wanted, or possibly even to a section within a course. So those 400 students in that lecture course I mentioned probably don't want to just be in one group. That might be 40 different groups or 20 different groups, can't do the math. Um, so you'd also be automatically enrolled, aligning with the sections of a, of a Canvas course into a sort of subgroup uh, as well. Privacy. You may have noticed that currently it's privacy by obscurity. Again, it's this, it's this link that you click on to join a group. Um, this makes it vulnerable for bad behavior. Somebody could expose a group. One of you, get, one of you could tweet out the link to the group uh, for this webinar and then expose everybody's annotations to, to view. Um, so, but with good citizenship, um, there is privacy uh, if people aren't sharing that link. Um, so we're FERPA compliant if everybody's behaving in that way. Um, but we are going to create a more robust way of uh, joining and, um, and, uh, and forming groups, um, probably some kind of invite-only situation. may come sooner or later, depending on, on how that LTI uh, authentication works. Um, accessibility was asked about before. This is definitely a priority. Um, we're a small team, so it's, it's not something we totally, we've been able to get to, um, but the first stage will be be completed uh, hopefully by this fall, which will be making annotations uh, readable through a screen reader. Um, and uh, we'll have a VPAT by then to have a university be able to work with uh, to provide accommodations. Uh, and then a quick follow to that will be the writability of annotations, being able to actually write annotations uh, through a screen reader. Um, what Hypothesis does, uh, and I'm sure all your minds are blown, what Hypothesis does is pretty unique because uh, it's not a website, it is not a platform, and so it's you know, it's a lot simpler to make websites and platforms accessible. Um, but some of the things that we're doing, selecting text, commenting on text, um, reading comments on text is, is sort of uh, new, especially when it's out in the wild of the web and in different types of uh, ecosystems. So um, accessibility is, is tough, um, but we're absolutely committed to it uh, and it's coming. Um, the last piece I wanna talk about in the last five minutes is our sustainability model. Notice I'm not saying business model, we're really not a business as a, as a nonprofit, so it's just a different approach to uh, software, a different approach to education technology. Um, we have several sources of sustainability, mostly from philanthropic foundations, uh, philanthropists, individuals can contribute. We launched with a Kickstarter campaign, um, but we're moving more towards a model where institutions will partner with us and become sustaining members of our sort of coalition, um, and that includes publishers, uh, platforms, possibly even Canvas, hint, hint, um, and educational institutions. Uh, and so the idea there is that for organizations that make substantial use of hypothesis, hypothesis technologies and services to become sustaining members um, and to help store the technologies and services that they're using, as well as the practices and communities surrounding those technologies and services, really to make this broad vision of web annotation come true, not just within Canvas, but 
uh, beyond. Um, and then there'd be certain services associated with this, which I'll go into in a second, but um, this is all in the interest of openness, sort of a, a first stab at what we think a fair way to work with um, heavy users, heavy using institutions uh, of hypothesis. Hypothesis will always have a free, fully functional, um, you know, application, both within and outside of Canvas. So again, you can sign up and use hypothesis in a course today at no cost, and you could continue to do so uh, at no cost. The functionality will always be uh, available. Um, so it's really a different approach than probably what you're used to in terms of education technology and uh, business models. Um, but in terms of the sustaining services we would offer institutions, um, obviously this sort of integration with LMS is, uh, could be a, a big deal, something we need to coordinate on and providing single sign-on for all users, training and resources relating to the implementation for uh, staff, um, hosting all the software and data necessary to you know, uh, keep this stuff protected but also accessible uh, to you and your students, to teachers and students uh, and administrators. Um, and then you know, tier one uh, and two support for students, faculty, and administrative users uh, using the technology. This is all sort of in process um, and so we welcome feedback. There's a survey at the end of this uh, um, uh, webinar that asks for feedback about the, the business model. So please do fill that out and, and give us your thoughts if you're in the position of uh, purchasing technology or partnering uh, with uh, technologists. Um, let us know what you think about uh, if this makes sense. I know FTE, for example, is going to be really different for uh, big public universities and for, for smaller institutions. Um, and one thing I can say for sure is that big public institutions like University of Michigan, where Michelle is, um, it may be by college. It may not be for the entire university that we, that we do our first pilots with. So it wouldn't be um, whatever tens of thousands of students uh, are at Michigan, uh, at least to begin with. Um, I think that is uh, it. I'm sorry for going on long. I'm sorry if people had to drop off. Again, this will be recorded. Um, I encourage you to sign up for Hypothesis. Um, become a, a Canvas alpha tester. Again, you can install the app today by exchanging some information with us and get, get cracking with it. So please uh, let me know, uh, get in touch with us if you want to start playing around or actually using it in the classroom. And then this is the survey link uh, or the form link for if you think your institution, if you're either in the position to say this or you're just gung-ho about hypothesis and you want to bring this to the attention of the folks, the powers that be at your institution about uh, launching a uh, campus integration pilot uh, in the fall, probably a little before the fall, so we have everything in place. You can sign up here and give us some information if you're interested in that more campus-wide uh, integration. Um, so again, apologies for going long. Jeremy Dean, Dr. Jeremy Dean, uh, Dr. J. Dean at, uh, at Twitter, and uh, that's my direct email address. Uh, if you have any questions to follow up from here, I'll be sharing the the uh, the video for this webinar uh, to all registrants, so you'll get an email with a permanent link to the, to the video. Um, and I will stick around, because I my schedule is open, but I understand people have to drop off, but I will stick around and do a little Q&A. Um, and I think uh, Nate and John, if you guys want to come out at hiding, Peg, uh, you're welcome to, but uh, Nate, you want to tell me a little bit of, uh, if, there's, if there's questions that people are sticking around to, to respond to? Yeah, so first of all, um, Jeremy, there's a, a lot of call for uh, to make sure that you attend InstructureCon. I will be at InstructureCon. Good to have friends there. Uh, so you'll be um, you'll be giving a presentation at InstructureCon. Uh, the schedule's not published yet, though, right? Yeah, right. But I'll be there and uh, happy to sit down one on one too and talk to folks, hear your ideas. Uh, however, I can be helpful uh, in Colorado. It'd be a great setting to to do some live workshops. <laughs> uh, Peg, can you also put the link to the um, the interest form for uh, to join the Canvas partnership? Okay, great. Um, and then, uh, Jeremy, uh, someone else is that Cindy's asked if we have any other LMS integrations on the roadmap. Uh, we don't have any other, well, they're on the roadmap. We want to become a full, fully compatible LTI tool. But again, because of the way that Hypothesis works, um, this is going to take work to integrate with each of them in terms of, uh, you know, the, how PDFs are stored and, and things like that. But it's on the roadmap. John, do you want to say anything about that? 
I was just going to say we uh, had the opportunity to take a vote on which were the next most requested, um, but maybe we can send that out afterwards. Yeah, that would have been good. I thought it was this was a Canvas uh, proud group, <laughs> but uh, we would love to know generally. I mean, whoever asked the question, Cindy, please, you know, let us know. We'll keep an tally of, of what should be next. Um, Another. Uh, Tina had the suggestion that um, she'd love to see the group homepage be more attractive, <laughs> uh, like like a Google Plus communities page she suggests, um, or something like that. Um, you know, I, one thing, Tina, that comes to mind about that is um, hypothesis is actually used. We realize that the design is very minimalist, but it's used in so many different contexts, um, including education and scholarly publishing and uh, scientific research and things like that that um, it's difficult to choose the right aesthetic that will meet everybody's needs. And so I think in the meantime, we've sort of defaulted to something that's, um, as you point out, uh, relatively uh, minimalist. But point right. uh, it, is a, it is a version one of the kind of, we call them activity pages, both the profile page and the group home page. And so they will evolve uh, and become uh, more attractive. I already have some suggestions. Um, I just shared another poll um, about uh, product priorities. Those of you guys that are hardcore and have stuck around here, which looks like upwards of 50 of you, uh, please feel free to vote there. Some, one of the, the first question is really about campus integration and what the most important thing for campus integration is. Um, and the second is uh, along the lines of that comment in terms of what functionality from a more pedagogical standpoint you would see as most valuable. So that's where you can vote on export, for example, um, to move up as a priority within our, uh, our roadmap. But that, the activity pages are version one, so they'll, they'll, uh, they'll be getting a look. And I know that we're hiring a designer, so um, they'll get an aesthetic look as well. Yeah, I think we actually managed to address a lot of the more specific questions. I mean, a lot of the questions that were left over um, in a way had to do with those deeper, deeper points about you know, the pedagogy of using annotation um, you know, questions around, for instance, you know, how do you, how do you encourage students to um, give annotations that are more meaningful rather than just, uh, I agree with you or something like that was one example. Right. Yeah, this is a, I'm, I'm, I feel bad that we did not have more conversation about the pedagogical because that's really the most interesting point. Um, and it's something that I'm happy to, to, to talk about offline with anybody. Um, and we have a community of educators and we can have further webinars about specifically the pedagogy. In fact, we have some webinars uh, on our website in the teacher resources about various things like using hypothesis with a, in comp courses, using hypothesis with literary anthologies, using hypothesis in history classrooms, so some disciplinary specific webinars. But um, it's up to the teacher, really. I mean, if you look at just the, the breadth of how people were using it from Chris's examples to Alan's, um, the, it's quite a wide range of ways that somebody can use hypothesis and, and ask students to use hypothesis. So, you know, Alan was obviously doing peer review. It's a little different from reading a sort of primary source work of literature. Um, uh, and uh, Chris was talking about both sort of more remedial classes doing a certain kind of annotation um, and then uh, upper level courses doing another kind of annotation. So how students annotate is really largely up to the, to the teacher. We have a lot of resources with, you know, different rubrics, not Canvas specific rubrics about how other teachers have encouraged, like for example, how to use it in a history classroom. Or what's my rubric for history classroom? We have those in our teacher resources, but um, it's, it's flexible for the teacher to sort of set that up, um, how, how students are, are annotating. And I think the Canvas, feedback piece allows you to sort of say, you know, these two line answers, uh, uh, Nate, are not enough. You know, I want you to say more to your classmates. I want you to engage more with the text. I want you to make stronger claims. You have the opportunity through that feedback mechanism to push Nate to be a little more verbose in his annotation. Yeah, you might not want to make me more verbose. But. <laughs> you know, uh, actually, Catherine, Kathleen, sorry, had a great suggestion, and that's that maybe there's the opportunity to have another webinar that focuses just in on the pedagogical aspects of annotation. I, I, it's a done deal. Now that I, I've uh, got the trial and error down a little bit with uh, Zoom webinar, we'll make a plan on doing that uh, before the end of the semester. So uh, I'll actually get that scheduled 
and send it out to all registrants when I send out the video for this. But that's a great idea because that, that's the most exciting part. And I feel really bad, Alan, Chris, and Melissa for, I'm sorry, Michelle, for not giving you more time because obviously, I mean, that, that was a highlight for me personally to hear those stories. And uh, there are many, many more as well. We have a cohort of over 20 alpha testers with, with stories as well. So maybe we can bring them in for that time. Great. Well, we, you know, there's, there's not really another host of, uh, you know, deep questions to answer right now. So maybe we should bring it to an end. Great. Uh, thanks, Nate. Thanks, Peg. Thanks, John, internally for, for helping out. Uh, thanks, Alan, Michelle, and Chris for telling your stories. Again, sorry for cutting you short. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, as I said, this will be available as a resource. I'm available as a resource. Um, moving forward. So feel free to reach out. I can already see on my phone that I'm getting a lot of emails, but we'll get help you get set up. Happy to chat one on one about the pedagogy of annotation. Happy to chat one on one and help you get set up with the app. If you're confused about the how it works to get things set up uh, in Canvas. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. If you're a real annotation nerd after this uh, hour and 15 minutes. We do host an annual annotation conference, <laughs> which we'll, we'll send out on the, on the chat here. Uh, it's in San Francisco at the beginning of May. So if you're in California and you really want to dork out um, about annotation and annotation in the classroom, Friday afternoon will be dedicated to uh, the education use case. Um, but yeah, please, please stay in touch. And thanks so much for uh, the overwhelming interest here. I, I, again, I've never spoken to so many people, even though I can't see you. Uh, it's, it's thrilling. Thanks, everybody.